Professor, you were born in Oakland, California in the 20s, I think? 1926. 1926. Who are your parents at this point and why are they there? Uh, my, my parents were both graduate students at uh, Berkeley, University of California, right. at Berkeley. And uh, the, uh, I was born in Oakland because, which is adjacent to Berkeley, right. uh, which is where the particular hospital happened to be. Uh, after my, my father got his doctorate, he uh, took a position at uh, UCLA. Which is where you really grew up in Los which Angeles. Which is where I really grew but, up. But before we go there, um, where are they from, your parents, and where did they meet? Uh, well, they met at Berkeley. They met at Berkeley. And uh, my father was born in Spain. Uh -huh. uh, and, uh, and my mother was born in, uh, in San Francisco. Uh, the, uh, uh, I haven't thought about that f for a while. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's correct. Uh, and uh, she was uh, born in 1906 and uh, huh. was, was uh, no, 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 sorry. She was born in 1903. Well, again, the exact day, but she was, she was born in that area, in the Bay Area. Bay Area. And uh, my grandfather uh, uh, and his wife, his wife and my mother were uh, uh, forced to uh, uh, basically uh, witness, witness the uh, San Francisco earthquake. earthquake and fire, and uh, which I believe was in 1906. That's right. It so was. my mother was born in 1903. Ah. Uh, and uh, it was pretty horrendous. Uh, people had to basically uh, live outdoors until things calmed down. Oh, it was catastrophic. 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 Right? Uh, um, what, what was, were they both in the same graduate department? Uh, they were both in the, in the Department of Spanish, yes. Both in the Department of Spanish? Yeah. Was well, she of Spanish heritage or? No, no, no. my mother was. Uh, that was just a, she, she was uh, getting, a, uh, I think she got a master's degree. Uh, and my father got a doctorate. Uh, but, uh, and my father took his first job in, uh, at UCLA, first and last job. <laughs> first and last job. A little bit like you, when you find a, 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 an academic home you stay. Right. Uh, UCLA was just expanding into its new campus in the western part of Los Angeles. And uh, he was part of that uh, first cr crowd of people that staffed it up. Wow. Uh, do, you, do you happen to know whether he had intended to, to return to Spain or was he pretty committed to an American life? Uh, I think he was basically committed to an American life. Uh, the, um, the Everything else I know is sort of folklore. Was, uh, <laughs> this is the, usually true about one's parents. Right. Um, are, uh, are you living in Westwood uh, as a family at this in point? In West, Westwood, yes. Uh, actually, Westwood, well, Westwood, uh, be uh, between uh, Santa Monica Boulevard and Peak and Olymp what's an Olympic Boulevard. I know it very well. I'm from Los Angeles too, so I know exactly where you grew up. Yeah. Um, what? How many children will there be in the family in all? Uh, I was born in 1926. My brother was born uh, six years later. Uh, so the two of you. There are two of us. Um, what is the nature of your schooling at this point? Are the schools good? Are uh, are your parents already worrying about your education and thinking that they want certain things for you? What is that intellectual childhood like? Uh, well, the public schools in, in Los Angeles uh, were, were pretty good. Mm. And uh, so that was 
sort of the norm, and, and uh, that's where I went for both uh, grammar school and uh, later uh, 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 a, uh, a junior high. Um, a junior high. Uh, I went to I went to the Selby Avenue public school, uh, private public school, uh, which was a few blocks from where we lived, and uh, then I went to uh, when I got of a, when I for the seventh, eighth, and ninth grades, I went to uh, uh, Emerson uh, Junior High. And you, then, your parents are humanists, uh, not scientists, uh, which is not necessarily always typical of Turing Award winners in terms of their, their childhood. Um, when are you beginning to develop an interest in science or technology as a, was it in your childhood or was it much later? Um, I guess I, I noticed a, uh, I, I noticed I had was was good at uh, at um, mathematics mm. and uh, and and uh, I, I wasn't particularly attracted to, to a humanist mm -hmm. curriculum, uh, but uh, to some extent my career was shaped by. Uh, the later events, later events, which uh, uh, okay. I guess the uh, about the time of uh, as I was about to graduate from junior high, yes, and go to high school, uh, I, I haven't. Worked out the exact timetable, but yeah, in uh, general. Uh, but uh, the uh, piv pivotal event occurred, namely that uh, we had Pearl Harbor. <laughs> Very pivotal, and uh, that shook things up a lot. Mm. Uh, as um, for example, my. My parents had, uh, I think, either rented or leased a, a small uh, beach cottage down near Mal down near Malibu mm -hmm. on the west on the coast, about I would estimate five or ten miles away, uh, and it was down. We were down there one one day when I, and I was on the beach lolling in the sand. And I, I had, I must have had a portable radio on, uh, because we suddenly heard about Pearl Harbor, and uh, that was a shock to everyone. Yes. Uh, and uh, the full import of it didn't really register right away. Uh, the uh, my. Uh, You're about sixteen at this time. Uh, I mean, roughly. Uh, 41. 41, I would have been uh, 15. 15, okay. 15. Uh, uh, and uh, so one of the consequences, one of the immediate consequences was uh, the U.S. suddenly imposed gas rationing. Mm -hmm. And the reason was we wasn't we because we were short of gasoline. It was because we we had no way to to get the the rubber, yeah, yes. the rubber for the tires, uh, were in very short supply. Yes, and uh, so the way of stopping people from driving too much was right. to put gas rationing in. Right. Uh, so that was one immediate consequence, and one of the other con side effects of that was uh, this beach cottage that my parents had leased and rented or rented. Uh, couldn't be accessed. Couldn't. It was. Uh, it was enough of a trip. He, we didn't want to take it anymore. Right. And Are you in high school at this? Point? Uh, I was about to, either about to, or or just 
just entering uh, university high school. University, the great high school, yes. Yes, uh, and it's in the western part of L.A. there. And uh, so everything, the war began to shape everything. Wow. Uh, in particular, uh, the high school began to offer an A and Z period. Uh, and it had the normal uh, one through five or something, but a beginning, A was before and Z was after wow. the normal scheduled times. And uh, the reason for that was so that uh, uh, young people could work in the factories or and uh, wow. support the help the war effort. Uh, I, d I, I took it another way. I uh, saw it as an opportunity to, to accelerate my education. Ah. So I took both A and Z. Yes. <laughs> and the normal one to five or some whatever. So the, a normal period in high school would have been four years. Uh, three. 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 three in the, it was a three, three. Three, three. And, and you're racing to make it less time. Make it less time. And uh, I basically was able to almost lop off a year. Ah. So I was almost finished with high school in two years rather than three. Uh, I, in order to uh, actually pull it off, I had to go to summer school the next summer. And uh, I took a couple math courses, which were easy. <laughs> right. And, and um, the courses, well, there's a general curriculum, of course, but are, are you expected to do major in a particular direction? Or? I don't recall I had a major at that time. Okay. Uh, uh, but it, it allowed me to uh, finish up at UCLA, uh, at uh, Uni High. At Uni High. Uh, and basically, uh, I was able to enter UCLA uh, in the, uh, forget the year, but it would, would have been uh, basically uh, uh, I, I was able to, and, and I guess I, I probably took a major in, uh, I don't know if I had to pick a major, but I was nominally uh, aiming at a physics major, I think. Yes. Uh, and you're about 17? Um, um, that would, what? yes, I was. And the reason I, I know that is that uh, by the time I was 18, mm. I was scheduled to be drafted. Yes, of course. And uh, that didn't, I suddenly, somewhere along the line, in the spring of, of uh, that first year at, at UCLA, uh, someone in t told me about the Eddy program. Okay, tell me about that. And the Eddy program was a, uh, a Navy program which offered 12 months of schooling uh, in order to train people to be electronic technicians ah. to uh, service and maintain uh, the sudden influx of, of sophisticated electronic gear such as radar, sonar, and, and the like that was in the fleets. Which is like, for you, a kind of beginning. So that, um, so that was a very attractive uh, path. And so what I did was I, uh, I aborted my UCLA experience uh, and uh, enlisted in the Navy. Uh, somewhere about May of 19, uh, not sure of the year. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, but anyway, it's going to be 42 or 43, something like that. Yeah. Um, and you're now be, going to control your participation in the war rather than be randomly drafted. That was... Right, and get a decent, uh, and get a, first of all, get a, uh, uh, a training in electronics, which is... Uh, seemed like a, an attractive thought, and uh, uh, basically uh, have a year-long education uh, in a different, yes. is a, 
basically as a technician, but right. but it was it was far more desirable than being than being just being a grunt in in, right. in some uh, some. And it's also a, an opportunity in a way to learn way ahead of the curve about the technology of the time. Uh, I didn't think of it that way, but... Uh, oh, young people never do. <laughs> but in retrospect... In retrospect. Um, it gave me a leg up because I had a, uh, a tremendous exposure to... Uh, um, at that time, uh, sophisticated electronics. Yes. Uh, which... Uh, uh, and you're finding that you're not so bad at this. Exactly. <laughs> I was always... Uh, I was used... To, I was used to being kind of at the top of the class. In uh, any case. Even in high school. Yes. Uh, and uh, not the very top, but among the top uh, quarter or so. Right. And, uh, uh, I, Is this going to take you away as you think about your future? And I remember how young you are at this point. But um, to if you will, a more applied um, notion of science and technology rather than the physics you and the math you had originally started with, or is this not really shaping you so precisely? Uh, I guess I didn't know where I was going exactly. Uh, the, uh, the Navy, of course, was a total preoccupation for, for almost a year. Uh, right. It was a a tremendous exposure. I mean, at first, uh, the program started with uh, one one month, or maybe it was four weeks, uh, in at a so-called uh, pre-radio uh, uh, school, which is at Manly High School in uh, southern uh, so, uh, south part of Chicago, uh -huh. and uh, and that was an exposure to kind of. Uh, get, getting you used to being in the Navy. Yes, yes. Or in the service. Uh, from there, my next stop was uh, three, three months of, uh, of what I guess they called, uh, I don't know, remember what they called it, three months of further training. Right. Uh, at, at, at a hotel, the Hotel Del Monte. Uh, at Monterey, California, huh. which had been taken over by the Navy, huh. uh, and which was a, a, uh, I didn't appreciate how famous it was till afterwards. But, till after. But uh, are you surrounded by very clever young men who had all been tapped for this, or are you finding yourself alone um, in your interest and abilities? What no, was I was with, I was with a. Uh, a cl basically a class of people uh, and uh, so uh, from Del Monte I spent th three months I guess that was called pre-radio uh -huh. uh, the, the title to, yeah, I, it was kind I'm of not it's just arbitrary but uh, and uh, that exposed us to uh, very rudimentary uh, Explanations of how circuits worked and uh, and and how uh, 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 how electronics the terms weren't in use yet very much, but uh, how how basically uh, one could analyze a circuit in a heuristic way right. with, without any precision, but just in sort of a understanding of what was going on. Right. So it's a, a ground work for you and a lifetime, really, to, to learn this process. Right. And uh, after pre-radio, uh, I was uh, assigned, my next stop was uh, six, six months of tr further training at what, uh, at what is called Treasure Island, which is uh, an artificial island that was built for the 1939 fair. Of San Francisco mm -hmm. World Fair uh, off of Yerba, Yerba Buena Island, yes, yes. And halfway between uh, San Francisco and Oakland. And uh, 
this it was on that island that the the navy had uh, uh, basically a barracks like uh, environment where we both had our uh, had our our sleeping quarters and uh, went somewhere on the island to for classes further classes and uh, we had in particular we had books which described uh, contemporary electronic equipment and uh, we were sort of walked through these various uh, circuits uh, various diagrams of the equipment uh, with heuristic explanations of, of why things worked and yeah. the way they did which was uh, the thing I remember most was that uh, the uh, we couldn't we couldn't keep our notebooks. We were forced to uh, turn them in every night uh, yes. because they were all classified. Classified. Uh, yeah. Do you do you because you have such a rich life? I want to proceed. Um, are you in the navy throughout the war? Uh, I was. Uh, the well, I, I finished up my. Uh, Time at uh, Treasure Island, right? And uh, it's approximately a year after I was in the in the Navy, and uh, my f first assignment was to be on the commissioning crew of a ship, a destroyer tender, being built up at Tacoma, Washington, mm. and uh, I was part of the commissioning crew, and uh, the ship wasn't finished yet, uh, but it was being being finished at, at that moment. And uh, so I was, my next stop was going to Tacoma, Washington, where I uh, did things like uh, help, uh, I think we, we helped load the ship with supplies and, and uh, various, I don't have any firm recollections of exactly of that. But it was, what I do remember was that uh, it was, uh, uh, I think it was in August, uh, August, I think my notes say. Again, I don't think we, we need the precise time, well, more what you're, you're doing and thinking. No, no, I, the, the key thing was that, uh, unbeknownst to us, of course, uh, Japan's surrender. And the yes. reason, of course, is we dropped two nuclear bombs right. on them. And uh, after the shell shock of that occurrence, the Japanese uh, were con persuaded they had no chance. Right. And uh, so suddenly the war was... Was over. Was over. Certainly the war in the Pacific, yes. You're right. And our ship was just about to be commissioned or and or had been commissioned. Um, and so we, we went on a, uh, I think we went up and down the coast, uh, the west coast in the ship, just sort of shaking it down. Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, sh the ship being a destroyer tender was supposed to, was a repair ship, and so it had a lot of interesting aspects about it. Uh, one of the things they uh, belatedly found, discovered that they had gone up and down the, the West Coast uh, and, and discovered that the ship was, uh, was not riding level in the water. And right. the reason was somebody had painted the bow markings incorrectly <laughs> by ten feet, and right. so the ship was was basically a, a t tilted. And uh, the reason I recall that was that the way they corrected that was uh, they uh, pulled into a uh, in San Francisco Bay. There was a particular island which was a munitions depot. And we loaded ammo for two days straight right. to uh, 
right, I, I, right, right the ship. <laughs> I've got to get you out of the Navy and into your next stage of education. Okay. So how do I get you to what I believe is Caltech? What is, how are you returning both the civilian life and to, and to edu education outside? Okay, I, uh, well, after the, con after the formal conclusion of the war, uh, I, I spent, uh, I spent about six to nine months in the Navy as we kind of petered, tapered down. Right. And uh, meanwhile, the ship had, uh, had uh, migrated through the Panama Canal uh, over to the west, to the east coast. Uh, which I didn't get to experience because I was sent to a special school for mothballing right. on equipment in some, somewhere in, in, the, in the east, which I forget where it was. Anyway, when I, when I returned to my ship, we were, uh, we were, uh, I believe we were in Por Portland, Maine, when. Uh, I was finally released from the Navy, and uh, I forget exactly how I did it. Again, uh, it's more, how do you then think of the next stage of your life that I, I, want, I want to uh, pursue? So the next stage of my life was to go back to, to, to uh, my family home in West Los Angeles right. and, uh, and contemplate uh, where I would go to college. Right. And, uh, I decided I'd start over and go to uh, Caltech. Uh, I had had a childhood friend who'd gone there and been in the V-12 program, and uh, he, uh, and it, I, I guess I knew it was, had a high reputation, and uh, so I, uh, and now I had the GI Bill in my pocket, basically, which uh, paid a lot of it, either a lot or all, of the tuition, right. and uh, so I didn't feel guilty. Uh, it wasn't a my, drain on your family. Drain, it wasn't a drain on my family. Exactly. Exactly. Um, do, so, you, do you know what you're going to specialize in yet? Or? Um, I think I picked physics because uh, I don't think we had to pick a major right away, but uh, physics was my choice because everybody picked physics. Yes. <laughs> Yes. It was kind of the, the, the challenge of the day. And uh, so I majored in physics and uh, had four very pleasant years at Caltech. Are you, are you finding that you're pretty good at this? Uh, I was always in the, uh, uh, they, had an honors, they had an honors section, a so-called A, and had two of them, an A and a B section. Mm -hmm. And I was all... I was in the A section. Right. So I was. Are you being encouraged by particular professors, or just the benefit of a broad Caltech education? Uh, just the benefit of a. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a few people that s stood out as some positively, some negatively, but but uh, no particular mentor. Okay. Yeah. You graduated in physics. I graduated in physics. Um, Somebody is telling you you're good enough to go to graduate school. Um, or are you not yet sure what the next step is? I guess I don't, it, I just, I never, I don't know, remember deciding, but, but I obviously did expect to go to graduate school. Right. Uh, and I applied to uh, several schools. Yes. Uh, got admitted by MIT with an offer of a, uh, an assistantship. Uh, a, pay, a paid assistantship, which uh, part time, right? Uh, and uh, that seemed like a good bet, and so that's how I ended up picking MIT, which was uh, it becomes your intellectual home essentially for the rest of your life. Right. Uh, I didn't realize I was doing that. No, but again, one <laughs> doesn't. But there you are. You're at MIT. Um, have you been asked to choose a direction there, or can you again? Well, in graduate school, they expect some 
some sense of what you want to do there. So what do you think you're doing? Are you there in physics? Are you there in some other, in mathematics? What? I was in physics, but uh, two critical, th first of all, to get back to Kelt to MIT, uh, I decided I'd drive my car uh, cross country. Okay. And I did it uh, all by myself, uh, solo, with, uh, packing it with, it was, it was a coup, uh, 1936 Ford Coupe, hmm. and uh, which... Uh, and this was way after 1936, so yes, it was not it, a new car. It was not a new car, <laughs> but it was pretty, it had been modified and, and uh, it had a lot of peculiar features in it. And, but I drove it solo uh, back to uh, MIT. Uh, and uh, the thing that sort of gives me pause now mm. is uh, how, uh, how many risks I took. Uh, I, uh, I ended up, I don't recall staying in any motels or hotels. I just slept by the road mm. at night, which was, in retrospect, a very dangerous thing to do. Right. But uh, I drove it in about, must have been, must have taken me two, three days. Mm -hmm. At least more, actually, must have been more. Right. Uh, but I, I got to Kelta, to uh, MIT, and uh, uh, so, uh, so what was the question? Well, it's essentially how your intellectual direction proceeds from okay. that. Yes, this Professor Morse, who was not only the graduate admissions officer, but he also uh, had, he was quite entrepreneurial, and he convinced the ONR to fund uh, about uh, uh, 10 or 12 fellowships, uh, or research assistantships, uh, which he could dole out to uh, key people, and he had offered me, me one of those resistances. Yes. And uh, so this got me exposed to uh, uh, some of the early punch card equipment, ah. uh, which was kind of dull, uh, but uh, in particular, it got me exposed to uh, w working at well, the world in one computer. Okay. There was never a two, but uh, the whirlwind one was kind of a precursor to the Sage system, uh, the air defense system I that guess. MIT built uh, through its uh, so its spun off Mitre Corporation. Right. And uh, I never was associated with it, but I did work with with I got to work with with. Uh, with the uh, with whirlwind using the the unclassified third shift from midnight to four or something, uh -huh. uh, which led me to some pretty horrible hours. But uh, uh, did it dazzle you with what it could do? I mean, in retrospect, of course, it couldn't do very much. But there you are experiencing it, it this. Whirlwind was a pretty potent computer for its time. Uh -huh. uh, it was uh, it could do a lot. And uh, it was uh, it was uh, it was still a vacuum tube computer, but uh, it, uh, it it managed to uh, uh, to do uh, uh, you could do significant calculations on it. Yes. And it had uh, cathode ray tube displays and. Uh, it, and, and paper, paper to punch paper tape input and output. Uh, it also, it, it did not use punch cards particularly. Wow. Uh, but um, it was a very fast computer for its day. Uh, it had a, uh, it had some home, home designed uh, memory tubes, which were a little problematic, uh, unbeknownst uh, to myself, uh, 
a year a year or two later when I was still working with Whirlwind. Um, over a weekend, they changed the cathode ray tube memory scheme to a core, the first core memory scheme, and uh, suddenly, uh, not only did the machine suddenly get faster, but became incredibly reliable. Uh, so that was a, a real eye opener. Yeah. And, uh, so I saw some of the very early. Uh, technology there uh, being developed and prototyped uh, on this machine, on that machine. Um, In this process, um, are you beginning to shape ideas of the direction of your research, maybe the dissertation? Are you becoming more fascinated with certain issues and problems? Uh, I got into a, a group with uh, Professor John's, John Slater, who mm. uh, was interested in, in uh, mathematically predicting the, the properties of chemical, of uh, molecular, uh, of molecules and the like. Um, mm. I ended up drifting around a bit, but eventually latched onto a, a topic of uh, computing molecular orbitals using uh, the whirlwind computer and uh, sort of ground out a thesis, uh, what was a thesis, but I wasn't very proud of it and uh, uh, basically got my degree. Um, but one consequence of this though was that uh, Phil Morse, uh, who had, uh, had persuaded IBM mm -hmm. to uh, to uh, donate the use of a 704 computer to MIT in exchange for which MIT would administer uh, the use of that computer with uh, some 40 odd New England colleges and universities. Yes. who would have time on it. And uh, ostensibly it was one shift, one shift for uh, MIT, one shift for the New England colleges. Huh. And, uh, but it was all smeared together. So it, it, it did, that, that was an artificial uh, division in the first right. place. Um, One of the, my memories of that was uh, it was one, forget the exact year, but uh, the the year that Sputnik was launched. Yes, fifty seven. Fifty seven ish, yeah. Yes. And uh, I was at the center uh, as a research associate. And uh, the uh, the U.S. was was basically shocked that uh, the Russians had been able to pull that off. Right. And uh, the uh, Smithsonian astrophysics observatory, astrophysics yes. observatory yeah, up, at, up at Cambridge, uh, basically near Harvard. Uh, came down and were using time on the computer to calculate the orbits and things like that. Oh. And uh, everyone was still getting over the, uh, the shock of, of uh, the Russians having done something we didn't even think about. Right. The Department of Defense got beefed up a lot. Uh, and one of the ways it got beefed up was in uh, trying to uh, create uh, 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 interactive computing, ah. and uh, the, the way the gr the group that ended up doing that was called ARPA, uh -huh. and ARPA recruited uh, uh, a person by 
John J. C. R. Licklider mm -hmm. to become to come down to be the head of of ARPA, and uh, Licklider saw it as an opportunity to uh, dole out funds to uh, to nurture timesharing all around the country. Yes, and uh, can you is. Define time sharing because, of course, it's become central to your to your work. Um, time sharing was a notion of of I think the first person I heard describe it uh, in any detail was was uh, John John McCarthy, yes. who is a, pro a professor uh, in the E department at, at MIT, uh, and. Uh, John's notion was uh, he had he invented a, the Lisp language also, which is another major accomplishment on his part. Uh, but one of the things he wanted he was advocating was a a large uh, computer. MIT should get should, should in his words should get a large computer with a million words of memory. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, of course, John's uh, private reasons for wanting that was, was that he could run list programs uh, in the million words. Fair but, enough. Um, so anyway, uh, McCarthy was advocating this, uh, and one of the other professors associated with the Computation Center. Uh, was Professor Herb Teeger, mm -hmm. uh, and her, he was going to develop a time-sharing system, uh, and he began, he sketched out, or had in his head, a, uh, a very ambitious time-sharing system mm -hmm. that was going to do everything under the sun, uh, including language translation and, mm -hmm. and uh, all sorts of other sort of ex exotic and peripheral tasks uh, as part of his research project. And so his uh, ability to create a time-sharing system kept retreating into the distance. And uh, right. so I got, uh, I got kind of frustrated with that and uh, decided to uh, do a very simple-minded uh, Time sharing system uh, using uh, uh, using the IBM 704, mm. uh, which and uh, with the help of a couple of other staff people, uh, uh, I was able to uh, uh, basically code up myself. Uh, in machine language, uh, a very small time sharing system, w which uh, would coexist with the other users' programs in the in the memory of a, of the so, of the then commonly used uh, so-called Fortran monitor system. Mm -hmm. so it's the batch system, and uh, these programs c could coexist. In the same computer, and uh, as long as programs weren't too big, uh, they could all run together. So uh, that means that people can. I mean, the essential problem is that it's waiting to have access to this because it can't process many different programs going on, and you're solving this problem, you and and others. The time sharing means that uh, things can happen simultaneously access to the computer. Am I right? Um, is that the well, not quite. Uh, dilemma? Okay. Please actually, it was, a, it was a very tricky evolution. Uh, uh, I think, I don't recall, Morse proceeded to persuade somebody back in, in the government that we, by getting another bank of, of 32 million words, uh, uh, Thirty-two thousand words. Yes. Not sh another bank. <laughs> yes. Of uh, 
of words of memory, we could have uh, both an A and a B. We could have a computer which had two banks of memory, one of which would be for the regular users yes. and the other would be for uh, the timeshare users. I see. And uh, so that made it easier. And uh, IBM helped too by, uh, I guess there was a, 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 a large, IBM had built a large box for communicating with remote terminals, uh, dial-up terminals. Yes. Uh, called a 7750, uh, which s some, somehow we managed to, uh, I forget who we coaxed into getting okay. us one of those, but, but we did have that. So suddenly we had an extra bank of core memory and a 7750 box. Uh -huh. And now we had the ability to uh, uh, dial up from remote terminals uh, using mo the modems of the day, which were sh big, somewhat bulky uh, modems. Uh, and you could have computers, terminals all around the campus or even at home, uh, if you could spare the expense. It so, must have felt like a radical advance. Uh, so it was a, suddenly we had the ability to rem remote access a computer which was miles away uh, uh -huh. from a terminal. Um, well, this was all going well. And uh, Lick, meanwhile, down in Washington, Licklider uh, saw time sh had seen time sharing. He'd seen a modest time sharing system on a PDP one or something at Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. So he he had experienced firsthand the uh, joy of, of being able to interact with a computer uh, directly. So he was down in Washington in ARPA, and he proceeded to approach MIT to see if there was any interest in starting a project to develop time sharing. And that's where you come in? Uh, well, I became a participant. Right. Uh, the key person to pick up the ball was uh, Bob Fano, uh, professor, who's a professor of electrical engineering, uh, and uh, had already made important contributions to information theory and so forth. Yes. He had uh, he had been he had learned a little bit of he'd been taught at the behest of the dean of engineering. He had been in a, put in a two-week crash course to learn a little bit of pro programming. But in any case, he saw the opportunity to uh, respond to Licklider's uh, in invite yes. to form a uh, time-sharing uh, uh, a big a time -sharing project uh, as um, particularly attractive. So he proceeded to write the, the proposal himself. Yes. Uh, uh, Basically, he, he proposed starting Project MAC. And Project MAC became the center of, of uh, time sharing at MIT, for, uh, a major center uh, uh, as a result of that, because uh, yes. Licklider. So Project MAC got the money from Licklider, from ARPA, and uh, was off to a what was then about a three million dollar a year budget, yes. uh, which, was, which was real money at that, at that time. Be more like six today, yes. uh, and uh, and of course they needed space to do all this, and uh, so uh, Fano was able to uh, lease a couple floors of of a new uh, uh, a new complex over Technology Square, huh. uh, which is uh, a building that had just been built 
um, as kind of a uh, it's an R and R and D center to, to lease out to clients uh, right. uh, by MIT. MIT had actually, I guess, uh, encouraged the building of it, but uh, it was only a, at, at least a. It, it wasn't quite a, a landlord, but it was. Uh, and luckily, a service bureau who had opted for two floors of the building uh, folded before it really got going. And suddenly there were two floors available. And so this Project Mac moved in on that, on right. that and had space to, to, to grow and grow into this building. I don't want to be melodramatic, but I'm very interested in your kind of eureka moment. I mean, you spoke a little bit about the frustration of certain things not yet happening the way you want. What are you out to solve and how do you do it? Well, initially, uh, Fano elected to uh, put at the core of Project Mac uh, a, 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 a copy of the, the computer system at, at MIT, at, at the computation center. Right. So, uh, and we used to refer to them by their, the panel colors. Uh, one machine was was red and the other was blue, <laughs> and uh, so so that went went along well. And uh, shortly after, and after we we were the, the project was running smoothly. Well, a couple things happened. Uh, Fano had a. Uh, we had an, an, an invited about, I would estimate, between one to two hundred prominent researchers around the country to come visit MIT ah. and see timesharing in action. Yes. Uh, so that was a so-called summer study uh, period. And uh, people came and so on, were encouraged. Uh, and. Uh, were you involved in the demonstrating of the? Well, uh, we, the we had the terminals around, and, and people could use them. I see. Uh, and uh, it, at that time, they were uh, pretty clunky uh, typewriters, selector typewriters, at at, at best, and uh, sometimes teletypes, and uh, the uh, the. Uh, Cathode ray tube displays had not yet shown up, except in, I think there was one or one or two very special con terminals that were cathode ray tubes, but uh, by and large it was typewriter in and typewriter out. Um, so where were we? Um, so after the summer study. And the dust had settled a bit. Uh, Fano encouraged us to uh, uh, start thinking about them, a, a new machine specially designed for time sharing. Ah. So there was a, a group of, of, of maybe a, somewhere between four and six of us that. Uh, went around and uh, visited the various vendors, potential vendors, right. to see who would be willing, interested in building a, a significantly large time sharing system. Yes. And I remember we, we visited CDC and uh, among other places. Uh, I think we were down, I don't remember if we went to Bendix, but we, we traveled around probably, you know, there was four to six different potential vendors. Uh, and uh, one of them was uh, GE Computer Department mm -hmm. at, uh, out in Phoenix. And uh, 
they in particular had a um, got very interested in uh, our ideas and proposed to build a machine especially for us. Mm -hmm. uh, they had kind of a wild man of a designer, <laughs> John Kalur, who had bit off, he didn't really understand programming very well, but he bit off, he bit off more than he could chew. Uh, and in any case, uh, out of that came the, the planning for uh, the, the Multic system. Yes. And uh, critical point. Yes. Yeah, and the Multic system was uh, was a uh, tremendously ambitious, overwhelmingly ambitious mm -hmm. uh, system, which uh, gradually got scoped out, uh, and. Uh, Uh, what's his name? Uh, Bell Labs. Uh, In any case, Ed David. Yes. Uh, Ed David down at Bell Labs. Uh, so we wrote a series of papers, and Ed David down at Bell Lab got uh, extremely interested and decided to join us. Uh, in a, 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 joint, a joint venture, basically, where we would all order the same equipment and try to work on the system together. Uh, it was all kind of idealistic, and uh, it didn't... Uh, but because of the logistics, uh, Bell Labs being uh, a couple hundred miles away, yes. uh, basically, uh, the center of the action became uh, around MIT. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and the GE, GE people, uh, they basically didn't have, uh, they weren't, they really didn't have research level uh, programmers available. So the, they were, uh, they were, uh, Oh, they were part of the effort. They, uh, uh, they, they didn't contribute a lot. Uh, so, Fano decided that we needed to write a set of papers describing what we planned to do. So, wildly ambition, your wild ambitions. Your wild ambitions. So we wrote these papers, which, in hindsight, were incredibly. Uh, and we presented them at one of the computer conferences. And uh, there, it was an incredibly ambitious agenda. And uh, Because most people were guessing you didn't have enough knowledge to achieve that yet? I mean, what? We d didn't really foresee uh, how intricate the problems would be. Ah. Uh, we... we Things that were kind of desirata were uh, taken as as uh, expect expectations of of uh, we could pull it off. Yes. So so, uh, so we started on this very very ambitious programming project, and Un undaunted. I mean, you you felt you could do it. We th we thought we had a chance. Okay. And we started it uh, with all the machinery we self-taught ourselves about how to organize programs and things. Um, but it it took a long time to to get really our feet on the ground. Yes, and much longer than we had anticipated. Which is not unknown in, <laughs> in research. And. Uh, we went through several generations of the system uh, trying to put it together. And uh, eventually, uh, Bell Labs 
and, and David down at Bell Labs had sort of sold the idea of uh, his group working on Multics as kind of a uh, the next big thing, which was expected to come in and, and uh, supply the labs with computing power. Ah. So he had over he'd been a bit naive to overpromise. Overpromise, exactly. Uh, and uh, so basically, they had to pull out. Uh, the, the rest, the rest of the lab at, at um, Murray Hill basically uh, um, pulled out, pulled out of the, pulled out of it, and Ed David basically had to, to drop out of the arrangements. Right. Um, but your your team is our team is still going. Still going. Uh, it's. Turning out to be a very hard slug, this is a stretch. We have gradually got the thing uh, up to speed. Uh, the initial version or two were so cumbersome and so that they didn't work very well, and people had to do drastic slashing of expectations and, and cutting and streamlining modules and and. We basically had to rewrite the system a couple of times to, to get it to come up to any reasonable uh, performance levels. But you did get there. Uh, eventually, we got there. Uh, and, uh, and what did the, just because um, we don't have much more time, I, I'd love to hear just the, what are the consequences of having gotten there for the development of uh, computer technology? I think we ended up basically putting out a, uh, uh, a, a set of desirable properties for large for a large computer, one that might not be entirely attainable right away. Uh, we uh, established a pattern, at least within our own group. Uh, you you write up what you plan to do be, before you do it. Ah. Up till then, programming had often been sort of the art of the possible. Someone sitting down with a coding pad yes. and uh, programming what came easily. Yes. Uh, here we were setting goals and, and objectives and saying we're going to program to meet that, and that was a kind of a, a new a new phenomenon. A new phenomenon. Uh, the uh, I think the biggest impact that Moldix probably had was by people reading the papers and uh, seeing, seeing out of all these ambitious goals, yes. uh, uh, being inspired to, to maybe p pick off a part of them or something. And, and, and although people didn't uh, try to replicate Moldix, uh, they, in fact, it was written off as a failure by many people ah, very uh, interesting. because it, it was slow, it was late, and so forth. Uh, we, we basically uh, set the directions of, of uh, designing before you, you program. And, uh, uh, and, and that, that eventually became the habit of researching computers. I mean, people your approach is what people picked up. I think so, I with. think so. Uh, it was not a... Uh, and, and I guess the fact that we got it up and, and working eventually uh, with a testimonial to the uh, uh, doggedness of the other of the groups, uh, but uh, it was it was a a major challenge to to pull to get it to that stage. Professor, uh, we'll end with that uh, the concept of doggedness, which is probably as important to research as any other uh, other question. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you.